Hello, everyone, and welcome to Compass Friday. And today's presenter will be Matthew Gorossi. Matthew has a bachelor's degree from Florida Institute of Technology on Oceanography and a master's degree in oceanography as well from the University of Delaware. He is currently a fifth year PhD student working with Dr. Tamai Oskokman. And his favorite hobbies are reading, biking, and kayaking. And today's presentation will be on ocean trajectory projections using machine learning tools. And now please welcome Matthew Grossi. All right, thanks, Gloria. So in case you didn't know, machine learning is quite the buzz phrase nowadays. And uh, there's lots of interest in what it can or cannot do in different applications. So today I'm gonna to talk about attempts at using machine learning for predicting surface transport in the ocean. The Deepwater Horizon oil spill was one of those events that we all hoped we'd never have to witness, but it also raised awareness of how much is still largely unknown about coastal ocean dynamics. I was finishing up my master's degree at the time, and I remember very clearly my advisor telling us that many oceanographers would make a career out of studying this disaster. And alas, here I am 10 years later. Uh, one of the most commonly asked questions at the time was, where is all this oil going to go and how will it get there? It's actually a very difficult question to answer because as the satellite image shows, there are many different scales of motion to contend with from mesoscale flows that we can see from satellites, all the way down to turbulent motions that we can't see. And in between these scales are what we call sub-mesoscale motions that last maybe a few days at a time and are anywhere from one to tens of kilometers in length. And it turns out that these sub-mesoscale motions largely determine whether oil will wash ashore or not, for example. But unless we have some tracer in the water, like the oil in this case, we're not yet able to observe sub-mesoscale dynamics because they're too small to detect from satellites, which remain our primary sources of ocean data away from the coast. One of the most common tools used for ocean forecasting are general circulation models. And these are built upon theoretical laws and first principles. So the idea is to uh, start with some initial conditions and then solve systems of equations to predict future states. But this is tricky because in order to do this well, we need to have a good understanding of the starting conditions, which ideally should come from observations. But ocean observations are still spatially and temporally sparse, uh, plus they're expensive and difficult to obtain. At the same time, we need to solve these equations over sufficiently fine grids in order to extract the sub-mesoscale information that we're seeking. And this remains a computationally expensive task. So as useful as theory-driven models are, and they, they are certainly useful, um, for, the sake of, for the sake of exploration, we wanted to explore a new type of model one that starts with the observations that we do have available to us and then learns from these observations instead of starting from Newton's laws of motion. So this is so-called data-driven modeling and it forms the basis of machine learning. Uh, machine learning has been relatively late to the game in oceanography and at least partially due to the limited amounts of data that we have, but this is rapidly changing and, and many folks have begun have begun exploring the, the use of machine learning in all sorts of areas of marine science. At the same time that the marine science community was beginning to become increasingly inquisitive about machine learning, the CARTH consortium based here at Rasmus was undertaking field campaigns in the Gulf of Mexico to study coastal dynamics. And the hallmark data set that came out of these experiments was an unprecedented collection of surface trajectories uh, from hundreds, plural, of GPS tracked surface drifters such as these shown in the Walton Smith. And we started asking ourselves whether machine learning could actually learn anything uh, from these unusually dense drifter arrays and then would be able to use that information to make predictions. 
So in other words, if we had a sufficiently dense observation system uh, that, that sampled sub-mesoscale surface currents, is there a future for machine learning in ocean forecasting? And this became the overarching question then for my work. To phrase in another way, we wanted to explore whether or not Lagrangian ocean trajectories contain any inherent predictability. And this may sound trivial, but it's important to keep in mind that ocean dynamics are characteristically turbulent, they're often chaotic, and therefore they're notoriously difficult to predict. So the first part of my dissertation is a systematic approach to answering this question. We don't want to jump right into the data right away because machine learning algorithms can be very tricky to develop. They almost never work on the first try. Um, and when that happens, one is left wondering whether it's a bug in the code or whether the hyperparameters need tuning, or in the worst case scenario, maybe the data are completely unlearnable. So instead, I start with a proof of concept investigation involving known flow scenarios, which I'll explain shortly. And then once I had a working model, I then tested it using realistic trajectories from an ocean circulation model. And so this first part was recently published in, in ocean modeling, and it was designed to provide a, a litmus test of sorts to test whether or not it was worth our while trying to learn real trajectories. Uh, and spoiler alert, since there's a second half of the talk, uh, it was worthwhile. And so I'll show some results on training these uh, simple neural networks on some CARTH data. Uh, these, these forecasts up here were on the order of, of hours. And so then next I'll go into looking at longer term forecasts because we're really interested in a few days out. And uh, finally, I'll talk about a more sophisticated type of neural network. It's been adopted from the computer vision community called graph convolution neural networks. So let's start with the simple artificial neural network. Here's a diagrammatic representation of one. Uh, they're essentially nonlinear regression models whose fitting parameters need to be discovered. So the fundamental idea behind training a neural network is to find the function that best maps the input variables to the desired output. And these so-called neurons of the neural network are nothing more than numerical values. And then the lines here are weighted links whose values need to be learned from the data. So here we're going to predict particle velocity in component form, u and v. And we're interested in testing the predictability of these velocity time series. And so one simple way to do that is to try to predict the next state from previous states. And the science questions then are, how well will this work? Um, or will it work at all? And what are the spatial and temporal limits of predictability? And then finally, are the field observations within these limits? But first, I want to look at how we train a neural network. And so look, I want to take an analogy from human learning. Let's consider the conventional teaching process, for better or for worse. Generally, some wise scholar stands in front of a classroom and communicates what he or she knows to the students. And so when we train a neural network, we pass examples uh, from a training data set to the neural network. And these examples need to have known answers, so targets, for example, of, of what we actually want to learn. So next, the students are quizzed or test, tested on their ability to apply what they learned to new or unseen questions, and their answers are graded according to some rubric. And so likewise, when uh, the neural network is presented with unseen examples from a testing data set, it's going to make a prediction about these examples based on what it has learned, and then that prediction will be compared to the target value using some assessment or, or cost function, as it's commonly referred to. And so here I'm going to use a simple mean squared error as my cost function, and the goal is going to be to minimize that error throughout the training. And uh, finally, we adjust the neural net weight to compensate for predictive error, and we keep going until we've reached some acceptable performance. 
Now, just as it takes careful planning to structure a course or create a teaching curriculum, we need to carefully set up the machine learning problem based on what we want to achieve in relation to how the machine learning tool functions. And so returning to our problem, I discussed in the paper two different approaches to training the artificial neural net. The first one I call a one-to-one -one network because I'm using one observation to predict one observation in like one time step in the future. Um, the second approach is what I call a time series network because it takes multiple observations in and then predicts multiple time steps out at the same time. Today, I'm only gonna focus on this one because it's a far more physically sound approach. Uh, a particle's future behavior is far more likely to be a function of its previous end states rather than just one state. Um, that's the whole concept behind uh, lag in traditional regression models. Anyway, notice what we're doing here. The drifter is moving along this hypothetical path here. And uh, we're gonna use a data frequency of three hours and I'll show why that is shortly. And what I'm gonna do is take 24 hours worth of observations. So in this case, eight measurements as the input to the neural network. And I'm gonna predict the next 24 hours all at once, but in six hour increments. And so by using a different predictive time step than the data time step, just gives a little better sense of how well the neural network learns the series. Because instead of predicting the next step, it has to do every other step. So the training process is gonna go like this. The ANN weights are initiated randomly at first. So this is what needs to be trained. The drifters are deployed and after they've been in the water for 24 hours, we start by training the neural network on these initial data. The red box then will, will show uh, kind of that time series. And as the drifter moves, we're gonna update the training set by replacing the oldest observation with the newest one. And I'm gonna continue training the neural network from where we left off at the previous time step. And then for the sake of these uh, simulations, I'm gonna issue a forecast for all the, the test drifters every midnight using the trained neural network as it exists at that time. And I'm gonna do this for as long as the drifters are in the water or as long as until we run out of data. And this approach to training is sometimes called continuous or online learning and uh, this floating window paradigm was first proposed in the late 80s by Miroslav Kuba, who's now here at the University of Miami. So for the sake of completeness, here is a schematic of the time series ANN. Uh, notice that we have the full 24 hour time series, but in three hour increments as input for both U and V. So there's a total of 18 input neurons. And then similarly, I have 24 hours and output for both U and V, but in six hour increments. I wanna point out here that my goal for the first part of this project was to use the smallest possible network, not necessarily the best performing. And so I use a single hidden layer with uh, 20 hidden neurons, which is pretty small for a neural network. But this allows plenty of room for improvement down the road with more advanced architectures if we want. It's also a lot easier to tune smaller networks. They're less prone to overfitting and they don't require as much data as larger models do. So for now, I'm gonna to adhere to Occam's razor or the law of parsimony and, and, and just state that for, you know, given two explanations or two models for the same phenomenon, uh, the simplest should be preferred. And I'll return to this later when I present a more uh, sophisticated approach. So the first part of my dissertation is a proof of concept, as I mentioned. Remember, I'm exploring the limits of predictability of these simple neural networks, and then ultimately want to determine whether the real trajectories fall within these limits. So to do this, I created several simulated flow test cases through which I invected hypothetical particles. 
And this way I knew how the particles would behave. There were no surprises. Here are some trajectories of the of three of the cases that I tried, all of which were scaled to a realistic uh, ocean eddy as much as possible. The first case is just a stationary uniform mesoscale circulation. So all the particles are tracing a perfect circle. In the second case here, I'm giving horizontal movement to that eddy. So the particles will trace a spiral uh, pattern in time. And then uh, the third case on the right, I'm taking that moving mesoscale eddy and I'm introducing in very simple form some sub mesoscale features around the perimeter and doing that in, in as sinusoidal pulses. And here the, 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 the filled circle shows where the particle started. And then these open circles are where that particle is every midnight after the deployment. And so these are where the, the forecast would be issued. Now I'm not gonna present any results from this part of the work today, both for the sake of time and because frankly, they're not all that interesting. As you can probably imagine, these first two cases are pretty trivial for a neural network. And the third case was designed to be an idealistic version of the test case that I'm gonna show next. And I'll just say that it learned sufficiently well for us to proceed uh, to that test case. And so I'll do the same. So let's consider then, um, I wanna consider a known case of interacting mesoscale and sub-mesoscale dynamics, which if you remember from the satellite image earlier is what we need to be able to learn. So I'm gonna use model output from HICOM, or the uh, hybrid coordinate ocean model, which is a general circulation model to get physically realistic flow field. And so here is an, this eddy, uh, it's a mesoscale eddy in the Northern Gulf of Mexico in January of 2010. The color here is, is velocity magnitude and the little white uh, vectors are just direction. But what I'm gonna do is release 360 particles simultaneously around the perimeter of this eddy. And then I'm gonna advect them for 14 days. Uh, so these red, these are just the, the uh, trajectory tails of these particles. The model had three hourly output, which is why I configured the ANN to take three hour input. Um, note the sub mesoscale circulations going on around the perimeter of this. Uh, that's these smaller motions that are causing some of these particles to escape the larger uh, motion. So these guys to the north, some here to the east. Uh, meanwhile, some particles are getting kind of sucked into the middle of this and others are just hanging, or hanging out around the edge. So there's all sorts of things going on here. And what I'm gonna do is subset these particles randomly using 75% to, to train my network and then reserving 25% uh, for testing. So remember, as the particles move, uh, I'm continuously training the neural network. And then every midnight, I'm gonna make a forecast for all of the test particles. That was a very baseline, very primitive baseline metric. I'm going to compare the ANN forecast to persistence, which is uh, basically a, a continuation of the last known course and speed of a particle. It's the best we can do without knowing anything else about the flow field. And so as I set this in motion, you'll see the, the particle, the real trajectories, the solid lines relative to the ANN forecast, which are the uh, dashed lines and the persistence, which are the dotted lines. Um, these are just a few randomly selected test particles because if I showed them all, it'd be too zoomed out and it would be even harder to see. But um, on the right here, I am quantifying performance using root mean squared error between the forecast and the actual trajectory. And I'm averaging over all of the test particles and all of the prediction time, so 6, 12, 18, 24 hours out. Um, I also trained three different randomly initiated networks to have a small mm -hmm. ensemble. And so that's what the subscript L here uh, indicates. The goal is to outperform persistence. And as you can see, this is accomplished most of the time on average. 
which is encouraging, but to be fair, persistence is not the most robust metric. So we can make the story perhaps a little more compelling if we can outperform more traditional time series methods, such as an autoregressive model. So here is a representative pair of velocity time series from a U and B from a randomly selected particle kind of toward the end of the simulation. And what I'm going to do is fit an autoregressive integrated moving average or an ARIMA model to each one. So ARIMA models just look for uh, regular patterns in the time series and then regresses those patterns and uses that regression uh, to make future um, uh, predictions. And so I can use that to make a 24 hour forecast here. And you can already see the problem. Um, because they're trying to fit regular signals, you know, we look at these and there's not really much in the way of any discernible um, patterns, at least not yet. And so this is apparently the best it can do. The dashed line is the actual um, velocity and the blue is the ARIMA forecast. Maybe V is a little bit better, but I would suggest that might just be by chance. And I can even make this go out further. It's like a three-day forecast. And, it, and at that point, it's the ARIMA is pretty much just returning uh, the mean of the time series, which is not terribly helpful. Um, one more thing to note about ARIMA before I go on is that because this is fitting past data, uh, longer time series are better than short. And so in order to use this as a metric throughout the simulated deployment, I had to fit new ARIMA models every midnight to the data that were available at that time. So this means that early on in the simulation, it's trying to regress only a few hours or a few days of data. And so performance is even worse than we see here. So I'm gonna to try to summarize that animation statically by looking at error over a 24 hour prediction window. So now I'm averaging over all the test particles and the ensemble members, but I'm also gonna average over the, the 13 daily forecasts that were made throughout the simulation. And so on the left, I show this for velocity, which is what the ANN actually predicted. And then on the right is the position that we derived from those velocities. Um, the error bars here are the standard deviations from the, the averaging. And this paper, this uh, figure comes from my paper, so it also includes the one-to-one -one networks, but um, we can ignore that uh, for now. What I'm really interested in is the, the green line, the, the time series network performance mm -hmm. relative to uh, persistence and even more so the ARIMA model that I just showed, that I just talked about. And the key takeaway here is that over this 24 hour prediction window, the ANN forecast errors are about half those of persistence and ARIMA both. Uh, and also with a somewhat smaller spread in, in standard deviation. Um, on the top here, I've just included a sample particle trajectory that shows what these forecasts look like, just because I couldn't include the animation in the paper, but. All right, so I explained earlier that you know, I'm using this rolling window and I'm training the neural network continuously throughout the deployment. So this is done because the domain is highly dynamic, right? The flows are constantly evolving. Um, and so the question that arises, well, does all this training pay off? In other words, does, how does the final version of the ANN compare to earlier versions? And so that's what I'm trying to look at here. I'm showing the three ensemble members that I mentioned, except this time I'm not gonna average them through. Um, uh, the x-axis is the forecast initiation time. And so in instead of averaging over these, now I'm gonna average over that 24 hour prediction window. And this allows me to quantify the overall performance of the ANN each time a forecast is initiated. So here the ARIMA is in maroon. And again, we can ignore the blue lines um, looking at the time series ANNs or the green lines, we do see a slight decrease in error over time, but I would argue that it's not really not much to write home about. What's more interesting to me at least is the change in performance of ARIMA in time. 
uh, toward the end, it's kind of converging to what the neural network is doing. And I suspect it would continue to do that if the simulation went on longer. Um, but like I mentioned in the last slide, the early on in the simulation, this, this regression technique is being applied to very short time series. And so we would expect that the, that the fit is worse in that case. And, it, and that's, I think, what, exactly what we're seeing here. Remember that the, the, um, the data frequency is only every three hours. So, uh, you know, in, in the beginning, you know, if, like the first day, you only have uh, eight data points to fit, and that's not very helpful. But this may suggest an advantage even to machine learning because uh, in this case, you know, one may have many short time series instead of one long time series. And maybe in a case like that, um, machine learning can do better because it can learn from all of the time series, whereas ARIMA is just fit to one at a time. So that concludes the first part of my, my uh, project. And again, I just point to the, the paper, which discusses some things that I just glossed over today and also goes into more, uh, more sensitivity tests and, and whatnot, if, if you're interested. So these results so far gave us hope that we should be able to learn real observed trajectories just as well. And so next I'm gonna take uh, the same simple time series network and apply it to observed drift drifter trajectories from one of Karth's field campaigns in the Gulf of Mexico, the Grand Lagrangian deployment. Here's an animation showing the drifters from GLAD deployed in July of 2012. Uh, there's 300 of them all together. As you can see, they start in the northern Gulf of Mexico near the Louisiana Bight, and uh, but fairly quickly dispersed throughout the basin. It's worth mentioning that about a month into the experiment, Hurricane Isaac entered the Gulf and kind of through the Straits of Florida and passed right over the, the drifter domain as a category one storm. Um, obviously that wasn't planned, but it gives some interesting things to consider. So stay tuned to that for that. Um, by the end of the three month period, the, they're pretty much spread out all through at least the Eastern Gulf and even some stragglers toward the West. So um, definitely quite a bit of dispersion going on. Now GLAD consisted of several strategic deployments as I'm showing here uh, over the course of a couple of weeks. So today I'm only gonna consider these two S deployments, S1 and S2. And also these two L deployments down in kind of the southwest here, uh, which I'm actually going to treat as a single deployment. Now the dots in this map uh, for each of these deployments actually contain a collection of drifters. So if I zoom in on say one of these S's, we'll notice that each node or, or kind of circle here actually contains three triplets of drifters, which means that each S deployment contains nine times 10 nodes, so 90 drifters. And uh, the same is true of the L deployments, except there's only seven nodes, so there are 63 drifters here. Now the S1 and S2 deployment locations were carefully identified in order to capture very different uh, dynamics. So S1 was fairly close to the deep water horizon wellhead, and it actually captured fairly homogeneous surface dynamics, while S2 was strategically located over a, a divergence zone. And so as you can see by just looking at the first 30 days of these uh, trajectories, while the drifters from S1 were pretty much all behaved pretty similarly throughout the whole thing, and then maybe later on some of them kind of escaped here, but uh, comparatively, there's a lot more going on with S2. They bifurcate a couple of times in the beginning. Uh, we've got maybe a small eddy here in the west, another larger one to the, uh, to the east of this deployment area, maybe a little uh, a jet of some sort going on. And this is just the, the first 31 days. So um, because these dynamics were so different, the first thing I did was to use the uh, neural network and, and train 
a separate neural network on each of these deployments individually. So in other words, train one on S1 and another one on S2. So these drifters reported their position every 15 minutes, but in order to be consistent with the exploration I just presented and to use the same network configuration, I upsampled these to three hour observations, just like before. Um, so with that said, I'm gonna consider here the 90 drifters from S1. Uh, so that was the region of uh, comparatively uh, homogeneous surface dynamics. And um, just like before, I'm gonna train the time series to take 24 hours of input, predict 24 hours out, and then make forecasts every midnight. And so this deployment lasts for about three months. So I have just shy of 90 days of data to work with. Again, I'm showing the persistence um, against the uh, ARIMA forecasts. Um, what's immediately noticeable here is that these trajectories are dominated by inertial oscillations. And we would expect these, and they certainly appear to be uh, fairly easy to learn and predict. Um, not so much by persistence, because that's always going to be tangent to the circle, but, um, but the neural network seems to do fairly well. Uh, toward the end of this, I'm going to fast forward here a little bit, but later on in the deployment, there becomes a little bit of a trade-off, perhaps, as the dynamics change a bit, and maybe some of these drifters end up in something of a jet. Um, but by and large, it does a fairly good job. So comparing the ANN that I trained on the S1 drifters versus the separate one that I trained on S2, um, showing the average kind of the, the forecast error over the prediction window, um, what we just saw was the, that again, S1 being dominated by inertial, regular inertial oscillations is was easy for the neural network. It's also, the, those oscillations, because they're regular, it's easy for a, uh, an ARIMA, a regressive model, to fit as well. So for S1, in this case, uh, ARIMA and the neural network perform just as well on average, both in terms of mean and standard deviation. S2 is a different scenario because there's more going on. Um, this time, ARIMA does better than the, than the neural network on average. Um, my, my uh, explanation for that, I think, is because there's, there are a lot of, there, there's a lot of variability in the dynamics, but there's perhaps not enough drifters to properly sample those dynamics in order for the neural network to learn them adequately. So um, my suspicion is that there's an undersampling problem going on uh, in, in this case. So everything I showed so far is applying that same ANN architecture and the same training technique from our first paper to the GLAD drifters. But we need to go further than that. Uh, the fact that we learned inertial, inertial oscillations is hardly revolutionary. And uh, we're really interested in the underlying current. And so what we really wanna do is, is to be able to predict on the order of a few days rather than hours. And so, uh, now I'm going to consider uh, daily observations instead of three hourly, and I'm going to train uh, neural networks to predict five days out using the previous seven days as input. So this means I'm going to have uh, 14 input features, so seven days times two velocity components, and then 10 output neurons. And I'm going to keep the 20 hidden neurons as before. Um, this time I'm going to combine the drifters from S1, S2, and the L deployments, and then I'll subset these randomly, 75% training and 25% uh, testing. But I want to take this a step further here and, and make the following uh, claim. It's, it seems highly unlikely that a single neural network would be able to learn 
all of these trajectories from all of these different deployments. So what I wanna to try to do is use an unsupervised clustering routine to group drifters by similar behavior and then train several neural, separate neural networks for each group. And so here's what that'll look like. This is an example from S2. Um, the, I'm gonna use a hierarchical clustering routine, which starts with each drifter in its own cluster and then sorts them using a minimum Euclidean distance. So at each time step, I'm gonna group the drifters using the last seven day trajectory. Uh, so just Latin lawn. And then I'm gonna check that each group has at least 20 drifters in the cluster. If it does, I'm gonna retain that cluster. And if it doesn't, I'm gonna revert them back to a single cluster. And the reason for this is because I wanna initialize and train a separate neural network for each cluster. Because the assumption here is that the drifters within the cluster are behaving similarly and can uh, help the neural network learn. And so I need to make sure I have enough drifters in the cluster to be able to subset. And even though 20 is, is quite few, I need a threshold somewhere. And so I just pick that as my cutoff. So I'm gonna set the problem up just as before, um, except I'm gonna use the, the full 15 minute uh, drifter data and advance the rolling windows by 15 minutes at a time. But within that rolling window, I'm going to upsample to daily observations as I'm showing here. So my observation time is day zero at midnight. My input sequence is going to be seven days prior, but at midnight each of those days. And then that window will advance by 15 minutes. So it's still every seven days, still sampled every 24 hours, but they've shifted by 15 minutes and I'll do that throughout. Now, um, this is cheating a bit because there's significant temporal overlap between these examples. And so each example is not truly independent of the next, but it's necessary here in order to have enough examples to work with. Uh, everything else is gonna be the same as before in terms of the, the uh, training, the, uh, the rolling window, the continuous learning and all that. And so here are the results. The uh, position error for the five-day prediction window averaged over all the test drifters and the daily forecasts. As we can see, there's no real discernible difference between either the, the ANN uh, or the ARIMA or persistence. They're pretty much uh, all the same. And uh, the same is true if we look at performance over the course of the deployment. So now I'm, again, I'm averaging over the prediction time window, quantifying each forecast. Uh, very, very similar performance in these three methods. Um, I've highlighted here the passage of, uh, of Hurricane uh, Isaac, just for reference. Just for the heck of it, I can extract a few random uh, drifter forecasts, just kind of see what this looks like. So here are four that I randomly pulled from the beginning of deployment on, uh, what is this, August 9th. Um, not very impressive, as if you, if you ask me, the solid line is the actual trajectory, the dashed line is the ANN, and the dotted line is um, ARIMA. Um, if we, pull some from during the hurricane, same thing, although we wouldn't really expect anything to do well there. Uh, maybe one fluky uh, success story here, but by and large, not, not very impressive. And then same thing at the end of the deployment. Um, so why is this? Uh, I suspect it can be attributed to a few things. Uh, first of all, these flows are very dynamic, they're very variable in both space and time. And so, as I mentioned before, with S2 uh, specifically, there's very likely an undersampling problem. The fact that ARIMA struggles as well suggests that there could very well be a certain chaoticness that may just not be predictable. Um, but I also suggest that this simple ANN is simply not the right tool for this job. 
uh, it's overly simplistic, which was intentional from the beginning, and it's been okay up until now, um, but obviously we've, we've crossed some sort of predictive threshold here. Uh, you know, if you're going to wash the outside of a house, you'd better off using a power washer than a squirt bottle. So uh, it seems justifiable here to, to up the ante a bit and let's try something a little bit more sophisticated. Now, with that said, we know that adjacent drifters tend to behave similarly, at least at first, um, while drifters that are farther apart are likely to experience different dynamics. And that was the justification behind using this, um, this clustering routine. But one question then that follows is, can we incorporate this information into a learning machine? So previously we manually implemented this by you know, clustering them first and then kind of like a divide and conquer type thing. You divide the drifters and then you, you uh, do different neural networks for each group. Uh, as it turned out, that didn't help very much, um, probably because it also meant reducing the number of examples available to each network. Um, but another important limitation of that previous method is that the neural networks only saw one drifter at a time. So what if we considered a group of drifters together and used similarly behaving drifters to help facilitate the prediction of any particular drifter? And this gets us into the realm of graph theory, where we can represent drifters as nodes and information sharing as links connecting those nodes. Um, and so now let me, I'm going to present um, what I would consider a pretty substantial upgrade from that simple A and N that we've been using so far. So Mohammed and colleagues published a paper about a year ago that demonstrated the use of what they called a, a social spatial temporal graph convolutional neural network. Uh, it's a mouthful, but they used it for learning pedestrian uh, trajectories. So the social part here refers to the fact that humans communicate with each other non-verbally. Um, for example, we subconsciously observe people navigating an obstacle ahead and we kind of adjust our course accordingly without giving it much thought. Uh, and also that when people are traveling together, like a couple or a family, they're likely to behave similarly, both in terms of navigating obstacles or, or even where they're headed. And so they wanted a model that could learn this behavior and then they showed that theirs did. So here's an animation that they provided as supplemental material. And it shows uh, two different pedestrian scenes and the predictions that their model made. Um, so their forecasts are probabilistic. And so they're generating so this point density cloud that shows the probability of the person being in that area. Uh, this is kind of a toy domain, in my opinion. Uh, you know, they're only predicting a few seconds at a time, as we can see here. And uh, when I read this paper, I wanted to know how well this approach might work on a more challenging problem like uh, drifter prediction. Obviously, there's far more variability in drifters over several days than there is with humans walking in a few seconds, uh, assuming no one has been drinking or anything. So a mathematical graph is a simple way of representing pairwise connectedness or relationships between objects. So one example that immediately comes to mind is modeling social or professional circles, like on Facebook, where we can simply draw a line between two people who are friends and then summarize the connectivity uh, in a matrix like, like I'm showing here. Now suppose we have a cluster of drifters and we want to share information between them if they are behaving similarly. So if we assume that similarity in behavior is inversely proportional to separation distance, that is to say, the uh, closer dr two drifters are to each other, the more likely they are to behave similarly, then we can use the simple inverse of Euclidean distance to summarize the adjacency of each matrix, uh, sorry, to, to summarize in a matrix, e the uh, similarity of each drifter to every other drifter. So the social spatiotemporal graph CNN that those folks developed takes as input two different matrices per example. The first one is a node matrix that describes the drifter's state. So this could be position, velocity, acceleration, whatever descriptive attributes we want. And uh, for every drifter in the scene. And then also 
an adjacency matrix that's assembled in the way that I just described using the inverse of distance. And so I'm showing here just a very simple example using these arbitrary numbers that I picked just to kind of show how that works. So, so the higher the number, the more the connectivity, so the more information that should get passed between the two drifters. So like before, I'm gonna to try to predict five days out using the last seven days of input. So to do this, we simply stack the node and adjacency matrices for each day in time, as I'm showing here. So we end up with two uh, 3D arrays, and we're gonna pass those into the network. Um, the original authors used DX and DY as input and output, um, which of course is just velocity that's not normalized by time. Um, I'm gonna do that as well, but I'm gonna also add acceleration here as additional input attributes. And the CNN will then output a new uh, stacked array containing basically whatever, whatever parameters we want to, to produce for every drifter and then for each of the time steps that I want to predict for. So here I'm showing just a simple DLAT and DLON, but actually the model produces um, a multivariate distribution parameters that allows us to generate the probability clouds that we saw earlier. Uh, without getting into the technical details about what's going on inside, I'll just say that the social component of this uh, graph CNN uses the adjacency matrix to combine information from other drifters by basically treating the entries of, of this matrix as weights. And then it takes the dot product of the adjacency matrix with the node matrix for each time step. And so if you think about the definition of a dot product, mm -hmm. you can have a basic idea of, of what that's doing. Um, but for now, I'm gonna move on and briefly explain the convolution part of it. So what the AI community calls convolution, mathematicians and data scientists call correlation. Um, I could have a whole one hour lecture on convolutional neural networks. So I'm gonna try to illustrate it in just a single slide. Uh, so wish me luck, I hope this works. Uh, CNNs are most commonly used for image classification or object detection problems. And so the basic premise is that an image is simply an array of pixel values. Uh, if it's a color image, it can be separated into three color channels, red, green, and blue, and represented by a, a 3D array of pixel values. So here are my exaggerated pixels here. So the goal of the CNN is to learn correlations between adjacent pixels and then find patterns that exist across all of the channels. So for example, if this CNN was to identify the Walton Smith in this image, it will anticipate seeing similar signals in all three color channels. So CNN takes a filter, which is a small matrix of trainable weights, and it passes it over the image. And um, as the filter moves across the image, the network summarizes the pixel information under the filter from all three channels. And it, and it casts that as a single value into what's called a feature embedding. And so you can kind of think of it as, as passing a magnifying glass over an image and looking only at a small pic part of the picture at a time. Um, now this new matrix may not be interpretable per se, it really depends on the problem, but uh, these are just random numbers that I generated for the, to illustrate. But, uh, but if you do this enough times with certain strategies, you can actually make CNNs that classify images or identify objects quite well. So I'm gonna apply this same concept to our stacked graphs, which are also three-dimensional arrays. So you can think of perhaps the drifter in the time dimension as being the, the image length and width, and then my attributes like DLON or DLAT as the color channels. Now, each convolution operates, or each convolution operation summarizes information across a single dimension of the array. So in this example, 
it, the convolution was operating across the color channels. In our application, the spatial temporal aspect of this, of this model is gonna be accomplished by performing two separate convolutions, one after another, the first to learn the spatial patterns and the second to learn the, the temporal patterns. I think I'll just leave it at that for now for the sake of time, but I hope this helped at least a little. Um, this is uh, trying to illustrate the way I divided the GLAD data uh, my goal here was to set the problem up as similarly as the original authors. Basically, I'm going to treat each deployment as a separate data set, perform a threefold cross validation, which means I'm going to uh, train three different models. Each one is going to be tested on a different, uh, a, in this case, a different deployment, and then trained on uh, the first 70% of the other two deployments and then validated on the last 30%. Now, this is a pretty conventional way of learning time series, but there's a major challenge with doing this with our drifter data, namely that the drifters behave very differently in the last month than they do in the first two months of the de deployment. Um, but again, for consistency and um, for consistency with the original authors, and also at kind of for lack of a better alternative at this point, this is the approach that I'm going to take. So now for some results. The green line here summarizes the, the SST, I'll, I'll abbreviate the SST GCNN, so the Social Spatial Temporal uh, Graph Convolutional Neural Network for the five day forecasts. Um, and the blue line here is the, the simple artificial neural network from before, just for, for the sake of comparison. Now this time we actually noticed some noticeable improvement over uh, ARIMA, which is the orange, uh, for the GCNN, both in terms of the, the mean error and the standard deviation spread. And looking at performance along the whole experiment, uh, you kind of see a similar thing. Here it's interesting to look before and after the passage of Hurricane Isaac. Um, before the storm, there seems to be greater performance variation between the three approaches with the graph CNN performing the best on average. Um, afterwards, they all kind of converge to the, to the same and perform the same on average. Um, we can again just look at some random test drifters as here from before the storm, uh, August 7th. Um, the blue shading is the graph neural network outputs. Remember, sort of a probabilistic of sort of point cloud type thing. And the, uh, the dashed line is the, uh, the uh, actual trajectory and then the orange is the ARIMA. And so um, uh, still maybe seems a little bit of a hit or miss kind of depending on the, the drifter, but, but by and large, I would say it, it kind of looks decent. During the storm, kind of all bets are off, everything blows up, but that's not really surprising. Uh, and then after the storm, as before, you know, there's there's doesn't appear to be much discernible skill with either method. Um, remember, these are just four randomly selected drifters, and so based on these standard deviations here, you know, some may do better than this, some may do worse. Uh, but by and large, it doesn't really seem to be much um, performance. And so I'll close with this plot that shows the number of uh, active drifters as a function of time, which is the blue line, um, which illustrates that the number of drifters drops off fairly steadily during the experiment. It's usually due to battery or GPS failure. At the same time, we see the average distance between drifters steadily increasing with time as they disperse throughout the basin, like we saw in the animation from earlier. So, both of these two situations are counterproductive for what we're trying to do, because it means that we are ultimately, we ultimately have fewer and fewer drifters sampling larger and larger areas, and therefore we're capturing less dynamic variability uh, as time went on. So uh, the 
immediate next steps will be to uh, try to take that last plot a step further and, and compare the GCNN performance to the spatial drifter density and see if we can identify a threshold that might suggest a minimum number of drifters needed for the model to learn, for example. Um, and I also want to look at the graph CNN a little bit more and see if there's anything we can do to enhance its performance even further. Uh, so far, it's almost identical to the original author's configurations, although I did some uh, hyperparameter tuning to make it work on, on this application, but um, we may be able to do, do a little bit better uh, than what we have, um, but we'll see. And with that, I will take questions. Questions for Matt? Thank you, Matt, for an excellent presentation. I see some in the chat. Should I read them or? Um, well, Mo had a couple of questions. So here's one. Is there a way to quantify the impact of the input layer on the quality of the output? I meant the number of inputs nodes on the output. Is there a way to quantify the impact of the input layer? The number of input. Oh, I, I see what you mean. Uh, in other words, do we increase if we increase the resolution of the of the input time series? How does it affect the the prediction? If I'm understanding that right. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, I would say trial and error, uh, which is which is. As unsatisfying as it sounds, that's the most common explanation for machine learning. Uh, you just try different things. Um, so basically, you know, we could keep all uh, keep all other variables the same and just increase the number of uh, of input neurons. The tricky part becomes um, if you increase the number of of input neurons, you may also have to increase the size of the of the networks, the, the number of hidden neurons. And so it's hard, that's why it's hard to keep all of things the same, but that's how I would suggest doing that. Do you think it is useful to sort of uh, not rely, <clears throat> I, I know you've been only focused on input layer that, that only take observations. Mm -hmm. Have, are you considering input layers that take other information, maybe that comes from models? Or you want to just say focused on observation input data? The idea here so far has been to just focus on, on observations. We want to see what, what can be learned from just observations. Um, so it's certainly possible to do that moving forward. And uh, I would even suggest that th that's definitely a, a, a good way forward, especially given some of the limitations of uh, machine learning, many of which we saw today. But, um, but our goal here has been to, to just kind of put all, all, all models aside and just look at and try to quantify what, how much we can learn from just the observations that we have. I would like to chip in something here. Uh, it's, a, it's a very important question, Mohamed. Uh, so um, first, first of all, I think what we are learning on this, in this machine learning project overall is uh, my initial hope was initially that we will do something better than say data assimilation, which was developed over the last uh, 30 years or so. But I think this machine learning techniques are not uh, necessarily good for problems for which there are very well developed algorithms such as ocean modeling or data simulation. So you need to have something that's outside of that, that depends on human ability or something like that. That's not fully quantified. So that's the 
feeling I'm getting overall. So the idea that we can beat maybe data assimilation, data assimilating uh, uh, ocean models is it seems like a slim uh, possibility. And that's why you have to always have a background uh, truth uh, that shows you how much you can improve or how much you are not matching that. Okay, so it's very important to know a reference. Whatever people are doing at that time, you need to put that as a gauge for machine learning and you cannot have this tool as a like a magic box that gives you everything you want to know or something like that. The second one is uh, the number of uh, observations that are going into the models, okay, per, um, uh, it's a long answer, but it's a per number of mesh points is very, very small now. It's only a few percent, okay? As the model resolution increases, the, the percentage of the observations you have to correct this huge degrees of freedom inc decreases. So while the model is doing a physically correct simulation, it's not necessarily the forecast for the for that scenario. Actually, the possibility of correcting small. And therefore, I think a, another, I mean, the same spirit is to feed other observations that are existing at the same place, same time. It could be radar observations. It could be whatever you have, non-drifter. But yeah, you, you feed into the same thing. And that is a, something ahead still we didn't touch that so far. Multi, multi sensor approach entering the same network rather than mixing with a model, which will be like competing with data assimilation. And I don't think we can beat data assimilation. That's my feeling. I don't think we have shown that yet. But uh, so these are the general thoughts on that. But it's an excellent point. My, my point of view is actually that data assimilation is machine learning. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, built it, on a Bayesian framework the yeah. same way that yeah. others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't object to that. But I was thinking that, uh, yeah, I mean, I understand. I understand what you're saying. But, uh, the, you know, one of the advantages is can you do something that better than um, data assimilative modeling? Can you do it faster, simpler? <laughs> okay, because not everybody can do data assimilation. Only NRL can do data assimilation. We cannot do a data I, assimilation I academia. It's just too expensive to have uh, 10 people working day in, day out for 20 years. It's just not going to happen. You can make a simple thing, but it's not going to be like real data assimilation. It's only the you know big institutions, NRL, NCEP do it. Academics cannot do it. So we have to find some things that can be like a faster, cheaper, whatever, more practical. Uh, it requires less computers, something like that. That's my thinking. I mean, I, I know you are experts in this, so. Uh, no, but I think what Matt is focusing on is, you know, is very important. Can observation alone do this? Yeah, this, this, yeah. Uh, this is, you know, I, I don't think enlarging the scope is, is feasible within one PhD thesis. <laughs> No, no, it's also the, for, the, the, the another deeper question is, is a forecast problem. Is this a reasonable approach for machine learning? I think I have questions on that too uh, at this point. Uh, you know, I, I mean, we, you know, initially you don't know anything, you enter it, but now I'm thinking, okay, is the forecasting problem the right problem? What is the right problem for machine learning? I and mean, that's the deeper question I have. I, I we don't know yet. Yeah. I don't. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that's I important. Have, oh, I'm sorry, but very nice, very nice presentation. I have office hours now, believe it or not. All right, bye. Thanks, Thanks Mo. Uh, yeah, I'd like to make a few comments. Sure. Um, first of all, that was an awesome presentation. You did a lot of uh, excellent work. Um, I like the idea how you clustered things into different type of features to try to get the, the better uh, fitting. Uh, here's some suggestions that you know may or may not work. I don't know. Um, you, you're doing in the adjacency matrices, you're using a one over distance weighting in that matrix. Well, we have Gauss Markov theory. We know Gauss Markov theory. Maybe you could use some weights uh, based on Gauss Markov theory and given, you know, using some of the results maybe from Raphael's dissertation, you know, where he looked at the Gaussian processes and estimated, you know, stuff on really small scale, which would, would help you the best. Uh, right now, you're putting all the data in, and uh, as is, which is, of course, the first thing to do all, all the time. Uh, but in the future, you may want to do some things with the data before you get it in here and get part of your signal uh, described. Um, some of the things that could uh, be is maybe defining spatial means 
And instead of trying to, you know, do everything with just the position and velocity data, you do things with anomalies. And it may be uh, that you could have, you know, some better luck uh, just looking at time series of anomalies around some space time average mean and what that would be, you know, can be determined based on the space time scales of the problem. Um, I think one of the things this work does show is it's how hard to predict Lagrangian motion. I mean, you're tackling one of the hardest problems there is, prediction of Lagrangian motion. If you predict Lagrangian motion right with the model, your model is really, really good. And, you know, we really don't have a model out there that can predict Lagrangian motion everywhere all the time, uh, as well as we want. So, you know, you are approaching something nice, the fact that you are taking information, you know, uh, from data only, but can this compete with data assimilation? The only way to really test it is to bring the model information in. I mean, you know, it's because you're, when you look at it from a Bayesian point of view, if, if the model has some skill, then you bring in an information and of course you're going to do better with data assimilation. So you're going to have to bring the model observations into this and do a similar um, analysis. And, and it may be that, you know, use some information about the integral time scales because in, in your problem, they're much different. They're order of a day, you know, near the shelf and they're order three, four, five days in the faster parts of the flow and how to, that may help you group the data better. And, I would concentrate right on trying to get things around right around the time of that hurricane passage. That is the hardest thing you're going to possibly do because there's non-stationary statistics going on. I mean, you can't think of a harder test to, to, to look at. But hey, really good work. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, reading your papers. Thank you. Yeah, so the, the, uh, the clustering routine that we did, um, I used that for the, for the, the, neural networks that were predicting one, one drifter at a time. And I had kind of had to do that manually. So the, the thinking with the graph neural network is that it kind of takes care of that in, within itself by virtue of that adjacency matrix. Um, but I like your suggestion about how to change that because that was one of the things I was thinking like, yeah, they just use the Euclidean distance and there's certainly an argument for that, but there probably is a better way uh, for our application. I know a lot of people are leaving, but I want to just say something to Arthur. Uh, thank you, Arthur, for your comments. And I think the anomalies is a very good idea. Hurricane passage focusing on is a very good idea. And I think that the one way that the models cannot do better than this uh, is that you know you have a, you you put a structure in the model. For instance, uh, that is not in the right place. <laughs> okay, so. Okay, that's that's where you uh, you mess up the solution. And, and All right. Look, and what happens? You know, just want to add. If you look what happens in data simulation, what only works in those type of situations is these nonlinear filter routines, like Chris Jones and his crew has worked on, where they have sanity checkers, where you got to bring in future data to make corrections. That's the only thing that really works. Yeah. Thanks. Thank well, you. thank you. Any other questions for Matt? Then if not, thank you all for your comments and questions. And Matt, it was a really excellent presentation and we hope to see the future work. And uh, with that, I think we're done for today's Compass seminar and we're looking forward to see you all next week. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone.